So we've uh, come through this day. Uh, we've had uh, a little bit of the past, a little bit of the present, and a, just a, a really engaging panel uh, on the future just before this brief break. And now we want to ask uh, where we want to go from here. This is a two-part exercise. We're going to hear from Scott. And, um, and, uh, and, but quite frankly, I want to make sure that I remind the rest of you that um, uh, following um, that, we are going, you are going to be up for a little bit of self-reflection and analysis on what you've heard uh, for the day. So I want to again remind you that uh, those members of the roundtable that uh, uh, we'll need to uh, finish with, uh, w with your contributions in terms of, of how uh, your one or two key uh, reflections or insights from, from the conversation over the course of the day. So our final uh, speaker uh, for today is Dr. Scott Ratson. He's Vice President of Global Corporate Affairs at Anheuser-Busch InBev. Is that right? Um, he has been an advocate for health literacy for many years, was a member of the Roundtable on Health Literacy, and we'd, we'd love to see him again in that role, um, and as editor of the Journal of Health Communication. Um, he is uh, uh, just a tremendous leader in this field, and has made a number of um, uh, contributions to it, um, and uh, I'm just delighted that he's with us to share with us uh, where do we go from here? Scott, you're up. Let me uh, first thank George and uh, Lila Rose, the whole, the whole committee for all the work you've been doing all, over the years. And it, it would be remiss, of course, as uh, uh, Ruth has been the champion pushing along in so many ways in how we got involved. But I actually got involved with health literacy, just as a little background. Uh, by a discussion here at the Institute of Medicine, and I know that Victor Shaw was here this morning, and I've talked to Victor in the past, but it goes back to a couple iterations ago with Ken Schein and then Harvey Feinberg, and uh, the people who are actually the executive officers, the Suzanne Stoibers and the Karen Hines of the world, who also deserve a lot of uh, praise for the tireless work that they did both here to get this going and the value that the Institute of Medicine adds not only to this field, but to all of the work that we're doing. So I couldn't say no when uh, Lila contacted me on behalf of, of the committee. This is a, an important uh, part of my life, and I'm really happy to see health literacy rise to the level that it has. So I was asked to speak about where do we go from here. And I'll give some background, and then I'll just do some basic pieces, and hopefully we'll have a chance to talk a little bit about it. But this is the world that I live in. C constructive ambiguity. So how many legs does the elephant have? And I know, does anybody want to take a guess how many? Well, depends. Four or five. So, you know, everything isn't as simple as we might like it to be. And this field is still evolving. And I will use the term field or discipline. And I was in a similar place, as I'll mention in a moment, with the field of health communication when I uh, started the uh, master's program at Emerson and Tufts. Uh, 20 years ago now, I just went back, and that's why it was so important with Sabrina and uh, the people who are now carrying on with that program. 450 people have graduated from that program, which was the first program in health communication. There are now 46 programs in health communication in the United States. So that field has found its place. I think health literacy is on its way. So this is how, it, just very simple, who, what, where, why, how, what, and what's next. So I have to disclose the other pieces that I, that I do these days. I don't represent the, I, any of these groups right directly. I work at Anheuser-Busch InBev. I'll, work a little, I'll explain a little bit more what that is later, if you're interested. Uh, and I've been editing the journal now for, for 20 years. And we're starting a new open access journal. So Betsy might uh, be right that we might only have an electronic version in the future. But it is a different journal, different audience. Uh, we get so many, uh, we get over 400. Uh, fi um, f almost 500 this year uh, 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 articles that come in. So there's lots going on. These are the places where I have academic work. And last, uh, Rima and I did the Dean's Lecture uh, in Health Literacy at Columbia. Uh, it was quite interesting when the person who introduced me didn't, didn't know what I was, when I was changing fields. I was at Johnson & Johnson before and said, we need to do what the beer companies do in public health. 
So we got to figure, and he didn't know, but at that point, I'm trying to learn what the beer companies do so well that we can translate into public health. And then these are the other positions that I'm engaged with. I think the last thing's important. There is a public-private partnership forum in the global health uh, section of the Institute of Medicine where we're looking at global health and safety, and Ebola and actually some other areas are coming up on there that very well tie into this, uh, this group, and I'm hoping that we can engage there. Uh, also with, with Alice in the Room, the University of Maryland Center and some of the others where I try to be a champion for health literacy. Now enough about me, uh, I got here through an interesting path, so I call myself a public health physician who's basically been engaged in all of these areas in one way or another. Right now I'm in the bottom right in the private sector, but all of us in this room contribute to health literacy, whether we're in the medical sector and research institutions on the left, uh, in the governments, in the foundation world, international health associations and organizations, and what's still called mass media, mobile technologies, mass, narrow cast, social media, whatever you like to call it. Uh, but essentially, we all have a role to play both as we live in the center and we also live in these organizations. So I, I think it's important to say who we all are and why it's all important. The journal, as I just mentioned, is almost 20 years. Uh, I think what's been most effective about the journal and Michael Pashorlo and Cindy Brock and others have helped edit supplements that we've had now, uh, four or five supplements on health literacy specifically. We also just did an evidence summit supplement for USAID and UNICEF, which is coming out, uh, well, is, is, is out electronically now, but launched uh, November 19th in New York. And we had a subset on health literacy. But believe it or not, I co-chaired this with um, Libby Hibbs at NIH, we could not find enough data in the global health world for the inclusion criteria that we needed, which was unfortunately under age five population. So uh, there is health literacy that's there, but again, the, the evidence base, I think as we heard earlier, could be much uh, stronger in certain areas. So where is health literacy? I think health literacy as I've seen it, and I'm not going through a lot of other pieces, Rima did such a great job of both the theoretical constructs and where we've come from, but I've now seen it as a strategic tool that is used in, in global organizations. George and I had the opportunity to participate in the first uh, UN regional meeting um, for the Economic and Social Committee in Beijing. Uh, that put health literacy on the global agenda where it's both part of three UN resolutions now and integrated in the national action plans, including uh, China and others, I, for those of you who participated in the roundtable a couple years ago. But I think what I'm hearing, and I'll have an evidence slide later, is more people are realizing literacy, communication, and education have a role to play in global health, and health literacy is that spot. So I think it has some flexibility that's there. And just here's, of course, here's some examples, notwithstanding the discussion Steve mentioned earlier about vaccines, which is a huge issue for health literacy, but it's also an interesting issue, as we know, it doesn't break uh, the same way as other uh, health issues in terms of uh, the target populations. So this is the term that I used and integrated in a lot of pieces of UN documents uh, as best I could because the systematic analysis of 175 countries uh, between 1970 and 2009, half of the reductions in child's deaths are linked to gains in women's educational attainment. You can also take this to poverty, uh, empowerment, and other areas. But this is really the key that helps drive a lot of the people in the global community and when they start to understand that literacy and health are intertwined. So how, how can these models move? You had, as I, as I mentioned, I think Raymond did a great job, and all of us live in different areas of this. We might say nudge of behavioral economics is really not different than social psychology, depending on who you talk to, but those are very important areas. The, the other fields, of course, are here, notwithstanding uh, the life course and other models that we often take. It would be wrong to think that all decisions we're gonna make are rational, uh, and hence the, the other components on the other side. And I'm also a big believer that the policy world is the only way that will be able to keep us on a sustainable front. So I think the simplest model that Ruth had come up with that she presented now four years ago, five years ago, uh, has really you know, made it simple so that we can understand and, ex and explain this to people. We also were very key, which is why the same, I think, definition made it in the Affordable Care Act, that it's not just the individual on the left, but the system simplicity that would make the huge difference. And I'm not gonna go into more of that. All of you know this better than me. But I took a load of Kickbush's uh, model that she's come up with, uh, who also came to our IOM meeting in New York, at the New York Academy. And it, it basically comes down to what 
at USAID, we were calling health competence. What is a health competent society? You have, a, you have to have a system that's functioning. You have to have an educational system also with, with the home, community, and workplace. And you have to have media and technology reach. And this could be an argument, as I heard the word Ebola mentioned a number of times, of which pieces were missing or are still missing in some parts of the developing world. Ilona also added, which I think Ilona and a lot of other people are strong with, the political and the policy area are the most important pieces at the end for the sustainability with a person-centered care. So the biggest piece I think that I've only heard a little bit about is the media new technology, and that's the, the world that I like to live in now. So I've taken Ruth's model, and I'm saying we need to in integrate more social influence and technology. How is the health choice, as I heard, the right choice, the easy choice, the smart choice, uh, how do we inspire that? Uh, and that, if I were doing a new piece of what's next 10, 20 years, how we understand that new green arrow at the top and how we hope that we do an ethical, uh, evidence-based, eminence-informed framework and thinking would be a way I think we can help make a huge difference here. So I'll give you a couple of illustrative examples. And I, I mentioned to Betsy, who uh, I met, of course, during the uh, the first current bibliography that I did with Betsy and Marcia in the, in the back on health literacy, which luckily, uh, I mean, I believe that we did the best evidence-based approach that we could, and culled it down and saw where the elements and the linkages were with communication. After that, I was invited to do the, uh, a lighter lecture on quality communication, a path to ideal health. And I was interested in a book of simplicity of astrophysics. Um, Sir uh, Michael Reese wrote a book, Just Six Numbers. And he explained the whole universe from just six numbers. So I challenged, can we do the same with health? And that was the beginning of, you've heard me speak here if you were here a couple of years ago, I presented the ideas that I mentioned in 2000 at the, the, our health literacy and primary and secondary prevention workshop that we had in 2009. And as Ilona and, and even Eric Topol and others remind, it takes about 17 to 20 years for good ideas to make their way from ideas into application. So, I came up with that, the model with a digital health scorecard, or a score, like a credit score. I brought it here, and I, I thank all of you for help, helping get it better. And we did a lot of focus group testing and so forth at a lot of universities at London School and Columbia and, uh, and others engaged. And we came up with what a number could look like based upon the 75% uh, risk factors of clinical preventative task force and others that are out there. BMI, blood pressure, cholesterol, fasting blood sugar, smoking, physical activity, and alcohol use. Uh, we did not make it uh, too complex. The only thing we adjusted for gender was alcohol, and we didn't do all the age stuff. But just to make it simple, can we come up with a simple number? And I wanted to say this because I think a health literacy metric is possible, and this is how it ended up getting published in Global Heart. The digital health scorecard, it's an app on everybody. Uh, well, if you have a, an Android or a, um, an, an iOS phone or an Apple phone, it was HIPAA compliant. Uh, it had the po potential for population-based measures. But what I learned was is not, no matter how good an idea is, unless you have the marketing muscle behind it or unless you figure out a way to get it to people with old technologies, it's just going to sit there on the Microsoft Store. And we launched it with Microsoft, and I, I did that. With, um, you know, with support when I was at Johnson & Johnson with some other colleagues. Uh, but I think the key is, is that's still out there and we've started to see how simplicity might be able to help in this area. But now, how do we link this with what should be simple, but it's not, <laughs> Ebola? Uh, I saw this unfolding, um, actually I was June 2013, the they say for the next big pandemic, I wrote an editorial suggesting that we were not prepared. Uh, in the journal, and this was after talking with a lot of global people. Uh, we didn't have an institutional source where we could really get good information that's health literate, that's understandable. You know, and I say that in a way, despite the fact that we have the NLM, and we have HHS, and we have CDC, and we have WHO, but unfortunately it played out exactly that way. And I wrote something for CNBC, Ken Mortsugu and I, and Ken led the um, Surgeon General's reports on health literacy for a year, calling for where is a Surgeon General? Where is there someone that's a trusted source that would be ongoing in this crisis? And next week, uh, November 10th, with Ruth and, and Cara and others, we're going to introduce some communication strategies for nurses. Uh, Nurse.com contacted me to, uh, to develop something. And we're using the checklist strategy and some of the other pieces that we think will be usable, and it'll be a webinar so it can be accessed time and time again. But the, I think three of people since I've been here have said this is a health literacy issue and it's a failure, as Rima said, of health literacy. 
it's not a failure of us. It's a failure to have the system implement health literacy. And I think if we can use this as an example, as that teachable moment, and be prepared for the next one, it would make a huge difference, because it's not if, it's when, the next one. Uh, and notwithstanding here, and I could go through a lot of back, uh, backroom discussion here, you know, notwithstanding, I'm on the CDC board of uh, scientific counselors for the Office of Infectious Disease, and we did a call in August, and the CDC at that point, it's public domain stuff, it's a federal register uh, piece there, said they expected a case to come to the United States at some time, and I asked the question, are we prepared for communication? The communication at that point was all thought in West Africa, not the communication necessarily here in the United States. There are things that we can do in this regard, and I think health literacy, this is a great opportunity for us to, to stand up and do something. This was another application, and I've, I've uh, Eric Topol's new book uh, that's, that's coming out says we need to move from the flip phone to flipping the system. The health system around is the individual is the empowered consumer. Um, this was Text for a Baby, which was the first public health piece of its kind. We, I, I was involved as a private sector component with the White House Office of Science Technology Policy. We had about 800 NGOs in the end that signed up. It's being evaluated by, evaluated by HRSA still, I hope. Uh, we published the, at least the methodology in the American Journal of Public Health. But the hope is, is that this is a way of getting health literacy, uh, getting uh, young people who use their phones, and the digital divide, despite the fact that it exists for the internet, does not exist the same for mobile technology. So if we can, I think this, if I had my, if I had my phone, this unfortunately, going around the world, I've been going to the world saying, we should all have health within arm's length reach. We now have a public health hazard here in arm's length reach. Stephen mentioned distracted driving. Distracted driving and other pieces where we have to start to think about the intended and unintended consequences. But how we use this and leverage this, I think there are opportunities. And uh, more, I'll talk a little bit more about this as well. But um, this text for baby hopefully is, is a step in the right direction. It's 1.0. I mean, it's not even near what it could be with a new smartphone. So I took this from Ruth, as you might re recall, when she introduced her new piece, the pie in the sky approach. I don't have pie painted in the Greek uh, letter next. But I think we need to think, continue and dream big. And we need to think, how do we approach health literacy to big issues? Not that what you're doing from, as I say, from patient to consumer to population. All of these are important, but I think we can dream big. So the World Economic Forum comes out with these global agenda reports every year. What are the biggest risks that are around the world? And I had been involved with this Health and Wellbeing Global Agenda Council, which sounds better than it is. We basically get people together. They come up with, well, what are the issues? And then we issue a white paper, more or less, and uh, they release it. But I think what's most interesting here is everybody, the likelihood is the bottom axis and the severity on the top. And these are mostly finance folks, so they're worried about what's going to ruin the system. So it's when the market crashes or asset price collapse and so forth. But when you start to look at it, you can see there's a lot of health pieces there. There's pandemics, there's climate change, there's developing world disease, and a piece that's here that nobody really noticed is chronic disease in developed countries. And this was the idea that helped the United Nations then have the only second time for a resolution, the first time for AIDS on health, and the second time was on non-communicable diseases or chronic diseases to move in this direction. So there are ways that these kind of councils do help set the agenda or engage that way. But if you see this and you think, well, what do we do with pandemics? Uh, do we do enough? Uh, that's maybe a rhetorical question. But what else is out there that we could help make a difference in? And this is where I'm going to bridge to an area that I'm very interested in. The number one cause of death for 15 to 29 year olds globally. I have a 15 and 13 year old now, so it's even more closer to me. And the eighth leading cause of death uh, in total globally, projected to be number five if nothing is done. Anybody want to wager a guess? A little bit, road traffic accidents, number eight right now, and projected with the current growth to go up to number five, higher than diabetes. Uh, despite the fact of all this, there's a UN decade of action, there's lots of activities that are done, and if you go to probably agencies that many of us work in, we don't do anything in road traffic accidents. Uh, but it is a public health issue, and uh, we're finding our way that we have an opportunity to do something in the private sector. So I'm showing this as an example. I think there's a health literacy component here. So I've tried to dream big in my new role at, at AB InBev and created a new coalition called Together for Safer Roads um, with a big vision. Roads are safe for all people. 
In some countries, it's pedestrians that get killed. Some, it's people on motorbikes, or bicycles, and so forth, and how we, how we can move that down. So I'm saying this now because I think it's an example where I'm getting different players, different people involved. So I have AB InBev, which we're chairing this, AIG, AT&T, Facebook, Pepsi, Chevron, Walmart, um, iHeartMedia. I know I'm going to forget someone, so it's not on the record yet anyway. We're releasing this with the um, Assistant Secretary General of helping help set the agenda for the next 15 years of what the, the, w, uh, the, the United Nations will do. And the U.S. Secretary of Transportation, Fox, will be coming to New York. And we're going to announce this with, our, with four other CEOs uh, with the idea that we think we can do something, where technology can make a difference. Ericsson is the other one. They make you know, lighting and other pieces that make a difference for roads. I've also learned how these are, new cars are going to be smartphones on wheels. So there's lots of different ways that we can come up with ways of blocking the texting, potentially, or getting into the human behavior. But there's a, this is like a, another example of a kind of health literacy piece, that is there something and what we need to do for both the system and then what do we do for the individual and how do we get this earlier uh, to help set new social norms. So I'm almost done. I basically have two thighs left. So what is the path forward? If you talk to people in human computer interface, I think that's the name of a, of a new field. Uh, they think that we need to use the, change the environment with the computer interface to help save us from ourselves in some ways. Uh, the Internet of Things, the new devices that are everywhere uh, that will continue to be involved in the health field. How can we leverage that? If we do have doctorless patients, where, you know, er, at least again, Eric Topol says, and others say, that we don't need primary care physicians in some places to, uh, or some, because uh, we can have computer interface. I'm not saying that's the right thing to do, but what is the path forward if that is the case? Are we having empowered, emancipated, engaged, or competent consumers? And how do we inspire people to make smart choices? And there's a lot of different things on the smart choice side. The smart choice in Maryland is to choose your right insurance, and then smart decisions how to use your insurance. That's one of the pieces that they put forward. Choosing wisely is a group that's come together to come up with the evidence-based approaches for diagnostics. How can we empower, I believe, a consumer to make smarter choices? And that's the biggest challenge that we need to do. If we need to, if we, the change is going more to consumers, how do we get those people, not only in the United States, but around the world, able to, to find out that information? So I. The last slide is going to be some ideas here, uh, meant to be activities that we can maybe talk about and, I, uh, and areas just to consider. So, you know, notwithstanding, I mentioned the World Economic Forum on the global stage. Obviously, the Institute of Medicine has high agenda setting power, not only what happens here in Washington, but you know, agencies, frankly, throughout the United States and, um, uh, and, and world. But um, certainly, we can make a difference of where the states, and we've had a number of pieces on the states, as well as hospitals, as well as uh, healthcare institutions, and not forgetting the role of the private sector, where there also is an important role to play uh, in this. So I think it would be great to have a new uh, IOM report, uh, also to potentially link this to where health literacy is listed in the Affordable Care Act. Uh, but a, a report with a committee, the proper kind of approach, which is, which is ongoing, uh, as the other ones have been. The second one, how do we elevate health literacy models for social and behavior change? Long-standing pieces that are not just uh, an interval, but will change society, will change social norms. Uh, the communication, I think Barbara did a great job of explaining the importance of communication training and how do we link with key institutions. The good piece is uh, I, I teach the course at, a course at Columbia as adjunct and they are putting forward a health communication certificate program that will be accredited by the state of New York that also has a health literacy component that then makes a difference to not only their public health grads but I believe it will raise the, the level uh, of the field as I, as I mentioned at the uh, Tufts 20th anniversary. I think we're seeing more and more of that and maybe there's a place for health literacy to find exactly in there. And are there new entities? Every time I'm here I hear about, you know, is there a, do we need an association? Do we need something else outside? I think obviously the IOM, IOM is a great place for incubating, but now maybe we're at the next level. Continue to build the innovations to people make smarter choices 
and I didn't say the, the eminence-based physician paternalism that's maybe changing, the white coat ethos of the old days to a patient-consumer evidence base where people may own, we've talked already about genome and privacy and so forth, huge opportunity for um, health literacy, understanding the genetic codes and so forth. And then finally, how do we invest in communication technology and innovations in advancing these partnerships to improve health literacy and thereby better outcomes? Uh, you know, I think the genie is out of the bottle. I, uh, we don't no longer have to continue to say that health literacy makes a difference to health outcomes. For years, and still, even when I was inside the U.S. government, I think I can say I had to argue there was enough evidence that communication makes a difference in health outcomes. I used to carry around meta-analyses and other pieces, not published in my journal, but other journals, to say it's not just this journal, it's Lancet's review, it's the, it's, um, the Annenberg School's review, it's, it's the WHO review. Um, I think we have enough now, so we, I'd like to see scale, and I, you know, I used to chair an innovation working group, and I used to remind people, we can't have 95% certainty with innovation. You've got to try ideas, and if they fail, learn from them, try another idea, try another idea. It's an iterative process, and I, I really think we can do that now, and you know, I really applaud all of your efforts. I'm sorry I didn't get to hear everybody today. I know all of you have really great ideas, so hopefully. George will keep us long enough to get those great ideas because I know you have to get them on record here. And, um, and if there's anything I can do in the future, we have uh, obviously other people that are involved, uh, not only with the Journal of Health Communication, but other areas. Uh, I, you know, I'm going to stick around as long as I can uh, to be here tonight. So thank you.